Next up, we're going to make use of pulse width modulation. Now this is especially useful in robotics. Let's say we have a series of pulses, a pulse train coming out of our circuit. That pulse consists of a positive voltage. And that pulse can stay positive for a long time. Or it can stay on for a short time. So let's say I run a pulse train out to a DC electric motor. When the pulse goes positive, the motor wants to turn. When the pulse goes negative, the motor doesn't do anything because both sides of the motor are negative. There is no current flow through the motor. So if the pulse width is really short, the motor can barely turn. If the pulse width is wider and longer, then the motor sees the current flow for longer. And it turns farther and faster before the pulse ends and goes to zero with no current flowing through the motor. If the pulse is really long, barely ever going to zero, the motor will run at almost full power because it has power applied to it for almost 100% of the time. So think of it this way. If the pulse is only on for 5% of the time, the motor is only seeing an average of 5% of the supply power. If it's on for 50% of the time, the motor is seeing an average of 50% of the power. We call this pulse width, or the width of the pulse, the duty cycle. If the pulse is only on for 20% of the time, that's a 20% duty cycle. If it's on for 100% of the time, that's a 100% duty cycle. You get the point. <laughs> so if our power is 100 volts, but we're only running at a 5% duty cycle, then the motor feels like it's running on 5 volts average. 100 volts for 5% of the time, 0 volts for the rest of the time. Thus, the motor turns really slowly. So you can see what's going on here. It's a way to control the speed of an electric motor. So we're going to build a pulse width modulated circuit, or PWM for short, using two 555 timers and a MOSFET power transistor and actually control the speed of our little DC electric motor. Here is our complete schematic diagram, which you can find in the downloads for this lesson. Looks a little intimidating at first, doesn't it? Now, many circuits will seem huge and daunting at first. Don't let it intimidate you, because you already know what this circuit is going to do, and you already know how you're going to do it. So just break up the circuit into sections. Here's the first timer, which is just set up in a stable mode and sends out about 100 pulses per second to the second timer. Now, you already built this circuit. We're just changing a few values of the components so it runs around 100 pulses per second. The pulses go into the second timer, which is set up in monostable mode. So whenever the pulse from the first timer hits this one, it is triggered to send out a pulse. But it's got a pot in the circuit, which will determine how long that pulse is coming out. Then that pulse gets sent to a power transistor, switching your DC motor on and off really fast. We're modulating the pulse, so how long it turns on and stays on is determined by these circuits. We've put a reversed BIOS diode across the motor 
because it has huge coils in it and so the diode protects against flyback voltage. There's also a diode reverse biased across R2 in our A-stable 555. Now if you recall, C1 charges through R1 and R2. Then pin 7 connects R2 to ground, so C1 discharges through R2 only. So when the discharge happens, pin 7 is negative and the capacitor is now a positive charge. So the diode is now forward biased and discharges the capacitor almost instantly. Pin 7 opens, so now R1 pulls the cathode positive. The diode is now reverse biased, forcing the capacitor to charge slowly through R1 and R2. So the output pulses have very short spikes coming out of pin 3. If the pulses coming out are longer than the pulse width coming out of the second timer, it completely messes things up because the trigger pulse overlaps the driving pulse. So you wind up with like weird beat notes, say every eight pulses or so when the pulses line up. All the other pulses are erratic in length. So once you built up the circuit, got it functioning and played out, played with it, pull that diode out and you'll see what I mean. Basically, you'll be sending a stream of erratic pulses to the servo. Your pot is also wired up in parallel with a 4.7K resistor. So basically, to get the greatest and best ratio of pulse width, we needed a pot of about 3.2K. We only have a 10K pot, so we cheated and put a 4.7K in parallel with the pot. When the pot is at maximum, 10K, in parallel with 4.7K is 3.2K. R3, the 100 ohm resistor, is just to protect the chip. Remembering on the discharge cycle, pin 7 is connected to ground. If we had our pot turned all the way to zero resistance, and that 100 ohm resistor wasn't there, it'd be a dead short circuit across the power through pin 7. Notice that we are using two separate battery packs for this. There's actually several reasons for this. We need the higher voltage to turn on the MOSFET. It needs 10 volts on the gate to saturate. We've got nine volts, that'll get it high enough, but six volts won't. By using two supplies, you can get to see how power supplies can be used to control a completely different power supply. The nine volt batteries didn't have enough current to run our motors, and the APAC did. So while you can use 9 volt circuit to control up to 50 volts with that particular MOSFET found in your kit, in this case we're using it to control a lower voltage, but all the principles are still the same. Our motor is actually only a 3 volt motor. Now it should be alright operating on pulsed 6 volts, but if the 9 volt battery could drive it, I wouldn't because that voltage is just too high. It'll probably damage the motor windings. So when this video finishes, you can go ahead and build up the circuit. There's a few optional things you can do here. If you want to build and test the different parts of the circuit, build the A-stable pulse generator, then hook up a bypass capacitor in your speaker to the pin 3 output, fire it up and you should hear a nice clean 100 hertz tone. Now you know that that circuit is working. Pull your speaker and bypass capacitor off, build up the second 555 timer circuit, connect your pin 3 output to pin 2 input of the second chip, then hook up a bypass capacitor and speaker to the output of your second timer. Turn the pot back and forth and you'll hear the change in tone coming out of the speaker. In fact, you may even recognize the sound as PWM is so common, you'll probably have heard it before and not known what it was. Uh, cordless drills often have a PWM circuit on them, for instance. If your circuit is working, great. Hook up the power transistor and motor and you should be in business. You can stick a piece of tape on the shaft of your motor to aid in seeing it spin. All right, build away.